Well, good morning, church. If you could just please stay on your feet and worship us this morning.
Please be seated. We are here this morning to worship this God who created us in his image, created everything. The God who gave it all to us and we listened to Satan and walked away from God and turned our backs on him. And he loved us so much that he sent his son into this world to die for our sins, to pay the price of our sins so that we could be with God as our Father and have eternal life and have a better life right now. That he pulled us away from the power of Satan that we had given to him. The power of this world that we could be saved. And so we come together to worship and that's what worship is all about. Rebuilding us. God wants us to change. He gave us salvation. He gave us the Holy Spirit. And so we worship him. Give him praise and to have this spirit of gratitude we need to have towards him for what he's done for us. To talk to him and realize we can go to God anytime about anything and talk to him, not just here, but any moment of the day, no matter what we're doing. That we need to listen to what he has to say to us through his word as we listen to the words here, as we read his words at home or where we might be. And we give our tithes and offerings as a way to remind us we got to get away from what the world emphasizes, selfishness that everything's about us and that it is about others because God says we need to love others as ourselves. And so by our giving, we're taken away from what Satan tells, tells us. And we take the cup and loaf to be reminded it is all about Jesus Christ and what God has done for us. That's why we worship. And that's why we need to carry this worship beyond this building that we leave. That is something we need to do each and every day to be reminded of the power of God and what he has done for us, to be reminded we need to allow God to work in our lives and to change us. So as we think about this morning, as we pray, as we worship, let's be praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of being your children, of experiencing your love, your mercy, and your forgiveness, that we can share that with others as we leave this place because you have filled us with that. So as we worship this morning, just prepare us to see you, to feel you, to hear you. And as we leave this place, we will always be open to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thanks, Lauren. And welcome, church. So glad to have you here. Those watching online, thanks for joining us here uh, this morning. And uh, we are going to be wrapping up this series that we have been in now uh, for the past several weeks. I, I asked a question when we started this series. You know, it's a tough question to ask, and even sometimes even a tougher question to answer is, where is God in our lives when it hurts? When pain, when frustration, when, when depression, when all that other stuff, when that comes into our life, where is God when I am hurting? And it's a, like I said, it's a good question to ask. It can be tough sometimes because maybe we don't want to hear the answer uh, to it, but sometimes it also we can get we can get fearful if people ask us that because maybe we don't know the answer to it. And we've learned a lot of great things over the past several weeks. And if you've missed any of it, I encourage you to go back online and check it out and see what God has been teaching us and how God actually, when it comes to our pain, when it comes to those things, that he can use it and we can be blessed in ways we could never imagine. But And today I want to take it and, and wrap this up by talking about how God can use our hurt, how he can use our hurt, he can use our pain, not just for our blessing and benefit that we We've learned over the past uh, several weeks, but how he can use it to help others in our lives a as well. And, and sometimes, you know, when it's helping others in lives, it can be instructing them. And, and, and you know, it's like it can bless them. And, and that can almost be frustrating to hear. You know, when I'm in pain, I don't want others to be blessed because I'm in pain, right? I mean, how many of you want to go through pain so others can be blessed? I don't think any of us would like to say, yay, uh, you know, sign me up, pastor. Where's that sign-up list? I don't think that's what's something that we would want to do, but it can be, and it can even to the point of ridiculous, maybe bring happiness and even a little fun joy, like this cute, true story that I heard uh, about this uh, uh, highway commissioner and that he had, he had injured his leg, he was in pain in his leg, so he was driving himself to the hospital, and he decided, you know, came up front, 
where the hospital was, and he was going to take and, and use their valet so he didn't have to walk so far and get in there. And this young man comes out, you know, that's the valet that's helping there, to get in the car to park it. And when he looks at it, he's, he says, wait, this looks, like, is this, this, this looks like some kind of official governmental car. I've never seen one like this. And, of course, the, the commissioner, was, he was a little caught off guard by the question, but he said, well, yeah, he is. It's actually an undercover police car. And the young man that was sliding in the front, he slid behind the wheel all excited. He says, wow, this is the first time I get to sit in the front of one of these. You know, and all because the guy had pain, he was in the front this time and not having to ride in the back as he usually had to do. And like I said, that might be stretching the story a little bit, but I think sometimes we forget the blessing that it can be because as we've learned here, if we're going to be alive on this planet, we're going to have to deal with things like sickness and sadness and sorrow and sin and suffering. We, we said that you, there's no such thing as a pain-free life, but we've also learned that misery is optional. Living in misery is optional. Another story uh, uh, to illustrate that is about the baptism of King uh, Agnes and, and that by St. Patrick in the middle of the 5th century. As they were going through the ritual, uh, St. Patrick, he had this cane later in his life that he had to walk with that had a point on the end. And as he was walking over, he didn't realize he placed it on the foot of the king and put pressure on it and literally stabbed the foot of the king, causing him to bleed pretty good. And, 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 and he looked down and he saw this blood and he just like, I'm sorry, king, I didn't mean to do that. Please forgive me. Why didn't you say something? Why did you sit there and take the pain? And the king just simply said, well, I thought pain was part of the ritual. You know, and I think that's what happens to us when we encounter frustration and pain within our life. And as you heard me say, don't waste the pain can, because God can use pain and have a purpose behind the pain that we have in our life. But sometimes we think, well, you know, it's misery. I'm supposed to be miserable in pain. So what good can come out of it? And we waste our pain not realizing that maybe God can use this to bless us in ways we can never imagine or what we're going to learn today, that maybe God can use this to help others in ways that I could never, ever uh, uh, imagine uh, when it comes to our life because that's what God wants us to do. With the pain that's happened in our past, maybe, maybe pain that you're going through today or pain of our future, he wants us to realize, yes, everything we learned, it can be there for us, but it needs to be there for others. And we've looked at several key scriptures that I keep bringing up, and I'm going to bring up again today, because I want to make sure our hearts hear and understand and know what God is trying to teach us. One of them, and of course, all these key uh, scriptures we've looked at have been taught by Paul, but one of them comes from 2 Corinthians there that simply says this. We looked at this last week and spent a lot of time where it says, God comforts us in our troubles. That's our pain. God comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. And when others are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. There's a big word for that in the church called redemptive suffering. And all that simply means is we take the trouble we've been through and we help others in the trouble that they go through. And sometimes when I'm talking about this and sharing with people, or if I preach on it as I am this morning, people will say, but Dave, how do I know that I'm actually getting over and healing from the pain and the events within my life. So I really can help other people. And that's a great question to ask. And one of the ways that we can know that we're willing to help other people is when, or, or, or excuse me, one of the ways we know that we're healing from our pain is when we are willing to help other people or we find ourselves helping other people. Because when you're in the midst of the pain, Let's be honest, we don't really care about other people around us. All we focus on is that pain, correct? At that moment, I mean, think about this. If you go to the ER, emergency room, I was just at the ER this past week with my father in law, Melinda's dad. He's, he's doing better and, and stuff. But, you know, you go there, you have this great pain, okay? If, you, if you've been to the ER lately, it's, you know, just like it was Thursday, it was jam packed. All the rooms were full, people were all around the aisles, you know, it was just completely full of people that are hurting. And when you go there, maybe you've got this great pain in your side. And, you know, there's everybody in that room's hurting somehow. But do you care about everybody in that room? <laughs> no. Let's get honest, people. We're in church. If you're in great pain, like on your leg or something like that, and you know the doctor that needs to see you is in the next room, it's like, I don't care about the people in the next room. Get the doctor here to diagnose my pain so I can get over my pain. That's exactly what we're thinking if we're honest when we're there. I mean, we like to say, okay, let the doctor take time with that patient. So when the doctor is with me, the doctor will take time with my patient. Those are very gallant words that come out of our mouth. Is that the right way to say that? Those are very nice words that come out of our mouth. But in reality, in the midst of that pain, what we're thinking is, 
I get here. <laughs> I need healing. So in the midst of pain, we don't know. But it, it, how we, or it's hard for us to understand our healing, but how you can know that you're healing from your pain is when maybe say you've gone through some great financial pain or something along those lines. And you don't want to talk to anybody. You're embarrassed. You're frustrated. You're hurt, whatever, depressed. You don't want to see anybody. You don't want to talk to anybody. But then a couple months down the road, you're sitting around with some coworkers or family member, and you hear them starting to talk about the same thing you went through. And all of a sudden, you, you start helping them. You start giving them advice. You're willing to share at that point. You're on the road to healing if, you, if maybe not already healed. You know, when it comes to that. And, and that's, that's why you always hear me make this statement when I say our greatest ministry will come out of our deepest hurt. Where God has us and how we find ourselves ministering to people usually comes out of our greatest pain because who can be more empathetic to somebody going through a crisis than somebody that's either going through it or gone through it themselves? So I want to take a look at how God can use that today. But I also want us to remember this. I, uh, when we, several years ago, we did a, did a big church-wide campaign. And uh, in there, I asked you to memorize this statement. And I think it's important to bring it up again as we talk about this. And it simply says this. I am a product of my past, but I am not a prisoner of my past. You and I, we are products of our past. We have these things that we've gone through but we're not prisoners of our past. I mean, there may be some bad things that's happened to us, some painful things that's happened to us, but we're not held captive. We can change. With the grace and power of God, we can change, and we can help others change. And that's what I want us to spend the rest of the time looking and see what is it then that we can share with others to help them. First of all, if we can share, and we need to share, how pain got our attention, okay? I mean, Pain gets our attention, does it not? If you're here when I kicked off the series or you've been watching, you heard me say yeah, God uses them like warning lights. You know, these flashing warning lights, hey, you got something going on, you better pay attention or it's going to get worse, you're going to get more in trouble, you know, when it comes to that. And, and I quoted C.S. Lewis that says that God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. So share how God got your attention. And we looked at like Job 36 where at the end of that verse it says, hard times and trouble are God's way of getting our attention. God's just got this way of getting our attention. He might not necessarily cause it, but he may allow it because it's like, look it, I want to get your attention here. And again, in Job there, he says, he says God gets them to listen through their pain because it's really hard to ignore pain. I don't know about you, I have a high tolerance of pain, but I still know the pain's there. And I may be go for a while, but there gets to a point where I can't ignore it. And pain can cause us to maybe turn in the direction we need to, even at the simplest level. When we lived in Iowa, Kyle, my oldest, uh, he, he doesn't deal well with change, especially when he was younger. He's gotten better as he's gotten older, somewhat, and, and that, but he doesn't deal well with, with change. And so he, there were several things that were changing in his life, but one of the things he had, I'll never forget, he had these pair of tennis shoes that he loved. Okay, and, but he'd wore them down. I mean, there were holes in the bottom of the crazy thing, you know, and that, and they were ripped, they were torn. I mean, we had duct tape, we put everything around it, you know, that, to make them last longer. At one point, and you know, we wanted to give him new shoes. I don't want new shoes. He didn't want to change. I want these shoes. I love these shoes, you know, and that kind of stuff. He didn't want to change to new shoes because he loved those. And at one point, Melinda threw them away, and he went dumpster diving to get the crazy things out. That's how much he loved those things. And, and, and so I was like, fine. I knew what season we were coming into. It was coming into fall. I knew what was going to happen in north central Iowa. It was going to get cold. It was going to get wet. It was going to get rainy. And you can only plug up and use so much duct tape to keep that water and stuff out as you're out running around as a kid because you don't miss puddles as you're a kid. All right? The puddles are there to go through, not around all right when you're a kid and we all know that as parents and we can remember being kids and and i knew what would happen and sure enough running out there his feet were getting wet they were getting cold they were getting hurting and finally through all of that he came to us and said hey mom dad i need a new pair of shoes you know and and i said that because sometimes it's the rain that forces us to do something that we've needed to do a long time within our life it's the pain that god can use to get our attention I mean, story after story within Scripture. How many, how many of you have heard the story of the prodigal son? I mean, we know that very, very well. You know, you know given, his, given what he was given, and he takes off and is having a great time at first, but then he ends up as a Jewish boy and not such a good... He ends up working with pigs. That's not good for a Jewish boy. Feeding them in low life, and he's hungry and he's starving. The painful situation he's in is what humbles him enough to get back into a right relationship with his father. 
And that's important for us to understand because we rarely change. We rarely change until we get desperate. We postpone difficult decisions. We ignore a problem until it gets to the stage of a crisis. I mean, we'll, we'll d- deny counseling until it's too late. Story after story after scripture, I could share with you about uh, this, but I think one of my favorites is Elijah in that. Elijah is throwing himself a pity party. He just had this great thing happen to him in his life, and that and God brings him to this place of rest, and he's sitting by this brook, and he's got this beautiful water and this beautiful area, and the birds are bringing him food, and he's sleeping and resting. So he's eating, he's sleeping, he's resting, he's eating, he's sleeping, he's resting. I mean, it's just great. And then the scripture says something in one of my favorite verses. It says, one day the brook dried up. One day the brook dried up. You know, and, and, and not to play a whole lot into that aspect with it, but I, I love taking that as an evaluation. You know, and, and asking myself, and maybe you know, right now ask yourself, has there ever been a time and event, you know, in your, where the brook dried up, the thing that you were turning to for the most, whether it's income support, you know, happiness, joy, or something, all of a sudden that brook or whatever that was it was bringing, all of a sudden that's gone, that dries up in your life? So this happened to Elijah, and Elijah, he gets upset with God. He gets mad at God. God, don't you love me anymore? <laughs> you ever gone through a hard time and said that to God? God, God, Why? Don't you love me, God? I'm a child of God. I've given my life to you. Come on, God. You know, I go listen to that Dave guy. Come on, that should be enough right there for a few pointers. Don't you love me anymore, God, in my life? And of course, God says to Elijah what he says to his children all the time. Yes, I love you. I just don't want you to stay at the brook. I don't want you to stay there. Because as long as that brook is there with that beautiful scenery, that nice refreshing water, you're getting the rest that you need, that's all good. But as long as that is there, you're not going to go, you're not going to move, you're not going to leave, you're going to get comfortable and stay there. You're not going to go on to what I want you to go on to. So I allowed the brook to dry up so you can go on to who and what I need you to be and continue to do what I want you to do. And God sometimes will allow pain in our life to get our attention dry up our brook if you will allow me to go there with that so we can take a look so guys like hey yeah that's a good place for you at that point but that's not where i want you to stay i've got these things in your life that i want you to be that's why we've looked at this verse every week that we've that i've been here and that paul when he was teaching to those in and uh, second corinthians when he was teaching to those in corinth he said these words i'm glad again not because it hurt you but because the pain turned you to god it gets our attention And we have to tell people. You say, well, why do I need to tell people how God got my attention? Because I think there's a lot of people out there in pain, and they might not realize that it's probably God trying to get their attention as well. And so they don't realize. Maybe there's people out that are around you, family, coworkers. They don't realize that God can use pain to get our attention. And when you realize that in your life, if you share that with others, they might realize that as well. But in doing so, you have to realize this. If you want to really help other people, when you share uh, you, you know, your own pain about whatever it is, what you're going through now, your past, you've got to be real, you've got to be humble, you've got to be honest, and you've got to be authentic. You've got to be authentic. And I, I really don't think, I mean, this is why we've been looking at him these past several weeks, there's anybody that's been more authentic than Paul within his life. I mean, you know, uh, he, he just shared from the gut. He shared from the heart. And if we want to help family members, if we want to help neighbors, if we want to help coworkers, we got to be authentic. And I know we struggle to understand what, is, what does it mean to be authentic? I get to ask that question all the time. You know, Dave, what does it mean to be authentic? And I'm glad you asked. Here you go. Well, the scripture says this. You got to be open about your feelings. Men, that means you have to be open about your feelings too, okay? That's not just a scripture. Yes, guys, we got to be open about our feelings. In 2 Corinthians 6, 11, we've spoken frankly to you. We have opened our hearts wide. Your feelings are your feelings, yeah. Right or wrong, that's how you're feeling. You've got to be open. But also, you have to be humble about your faults. Humble about your faults. Galatians 5, 6 says, Each of us have to bear our, the faults and the burdens of his own. For none of us, none of us are perfect. Be humble about your faults. But also, learn to be frank about your failures. Frank about the failures that you have within your life. I like what Paul says to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the chief, I'm the worst. Uh, you know, it just shows me the humanity of Paul. 
I mean, in, in the church, we've taken and placed this guy who's written a good hunk of the New Testament and done these things, and we placed him up on this pedestal. And I understand why. He has done great things for God's kingdom, but he's no different than any of us sitting here. He's made of the same bone and flesh and has blood, just like you and I. He's just a man who answered the call of God and said yes to God. But did he struggle? Yes. Did he have concerns and fears? Yes, we're going to hear that. We've seen that and we've heard that. Did he have pain? Absolutely because he's no different than us. And he had these, look at this, but he was honest. Again, the fourth thing, be honest about your frustration. Your frustrations, your fears, and your faults. Again, when he was writing to the Romans, Paul says, I've got the desire to do what is right, but I can't carry it out. I keep on doing evil I don't want to do. I don't want to do. And that, you know, that's being honest. That's being humble. That's being authentic. And then be candid about your fears. Again, this is speaking to us too, guys. All right. I mean, I mean, in this world that we live in, in, in stuff, you know, it's uh, uh, they teach us men, you know, that we're supposed to not be and 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 it, it, speaking to both men and women when it comes to this. But, you know, I mean, we're not supposed to show our fears. When I was talking about fathers and and, you know, on Father's Day and talking about the weakness that dads have to face and the way the world looks at dads, you know, and if I show a fear, if I show my true feelings, I am a weak weak male i'm a weak man because i'm supposed to be rambo or john wayne or whoever it is that you look up to you've heard me say this before riding in and facing the 500 you know boldly machine guns ablazing, saving the day you know and 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 that's who i'm supposed to be as a man of god and and uh, um yes i'm to be a warrior men and women are to fight the battle together men and women when you know when it comes to that aspect on it um but you know it's okay it's okay to share that when you see those 100, 200, 300, 500 soldiers running at you that you're afraid. You know, share your fears. Be open about your fears. Paul, you know, he said this. I do admit that I have fears. Okay, this is this great Christian guy we put on a pestle. I do admit that I have fears that when I come to you, you'll disappoint me and I'll disappoint you. <laughs> That's being pretty blunt, you know. And in frustration with each other, everything will fall to pieces. So I, I, I share how pain got my attention. But then, you and I, we need to share what we learned from our pain. Not only do we share because it got our attention, so because God might be getting others as well, but what did we learn? Again, in Job, it says this, God, God, what does it say, the second word there? God what? Teaches. So if God's teaching, that means there must be something we're supposed to learn. God teaches people through suffering, and he uses distress to open their eyes to open their eyes. He's trying to teach us some things within our lives. He wants us to learn some things within our lives. So, uh, you know, I'm always about e asking evaluation questions, taking a look, and, and as you look at the pain maybe you're going through now or maybe the pain you've been through in the past, you know, some great question is, what, what is God trying to teach you? What is God trying to open your eyes to? What is God trying to show you? And what are you learning? Because once we've learned it in that, once we see that, he wants us to pass that on with others in our lives. And, and we'll all go through all, I've said it many, many times. We go through different kinds of troubles. We go through different kinds of pain, physical, emotional, whatever. And, and, and there's things we can learn. But I think there's three major things that God wants us to learn through this stuff in our life. First of all, he wants us to learn to depend more on God, to depend more on him, you know. And, and in that Second Corinthians chapter we've been looking at, the famous passage we read a little bit earlier, Paul says, you know, he's talking about all the tough times that he went through in Asia, and then he says this, we were crushed, we were overwhelmed, we saw how powerless we were to help ourselves, and then he says these weird words, but that was good. Why? For then we put everything into the hands of God, who alone could save us, and he did help us. See, God wants to teach us about himself. He wants to teach us about his power when we are at our weakest. He wants to teach us about his love when we feel unloving. He wants to teach us about his grace when we feel unforgiving. He wants us to teach us about his wisdom when we just feel, I just don't have an answer. You know, I don't know what to do. I don't know which way to turn. God says, I want you to learn some lessons, to depend on him, but also secondly, to trust and obey God's word. And that's so easy to do when things are going our way, amen? <laughs> 
when things are going the way that we like and there's no problems, there's no troubles, there's no pain, it's easy to do that. And, and it's easy when we're reading the passage of Scripture in our quiet time and we agree with those passages of Scripture, but then what do we do when we come to those challenging passages of Scripture that go against what my flesh says, what my heart says, and everything, but the Spirit's teaching me this truth, but I want to believe this because, the, wow, that gets a little more difficult. Or when I have this pain and problems and I end up being like Elijah, don't you love me anymore, God? Don't you love me anymore? He says, I want to do this to learn to teach you to trust and obey my word. Again, remember King David in 119th Psalm? Before I was afflicted, talking about the pain he had, before I was afflicted, I used to, I used to wander off. But now I closely follow your word. Because of the thankfulness that he had to God, because God brought this into his life, he was able to turn back to God, you know, to trust and obey God's word. And to understand the third thing he wants us to learn is we need other people. We need other people. I say this all the time. And sometimes, you know, I think sometimes people, maybe, maybe you kind of, Dave, you're beating a dead horse. I'm beating a dead horse because we struggle with this. We struggle with this right here. You know, this being authentic that I talked about because you need other people. If you didn't have pain, you wouldn't need other people. But having pain helps us understand in Galatians when it says we are to carry each other's burdens. I'm to carry yours. You're to carry mine. Okay? Because you see, this is something I think we don't understand. God wants to teach me about myself through you. God wants to teach you about yourself through other people. And I, I think we forget that, or, or maybe we don't realize that, but he wants to teach you about you, but not directly. He wants to do it through other people. When we build these relationships, when we come together and we build those that we can trust, then you're going to have somebody, if you know them and, and trust them, they can point out a weakness that maybe you're not willing to get honest and open and authentic about. Really? I sound like that? Really? That's what I was doing? Okay, you know, they can point out maybe a flaw in the character because they can see that maybe we are unwilling to see or unwilling to admit because most of the time, ten fingers pointed here, I'm not willing to face the truth about myself really until I'm forced to because, you know, the Bible tells us our heart's deceitful. We, we lie to ourselves because we don't want to admit the truth about ourselves. So when a problem arises in our life, when we're in pain, you know, maybe some of the, the, the best question to ask isn't why. It's an okay question to ask. Why, God? But maybe a better question to ask is this. What? What is it, God, you want me to learn? That's what we're talking about here. And then the third thing I need to share is how God is God bringing good out of the pain? And like I said, that might be a little tough when you're in the midst of pain, like that illustration being in the hospital. A lot of that can come looking back, hindsight, that 2020 you know, to see how God has been there. Paul, when he was writing to the Philippians, he said this in Philippians 1.12, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. Now, he's writing this letter to those in Philippi, and he's thanking them for the prayers and everything that they've done to help him. And he's, he's reassuring them. He's giving them hope that we're going to talk about in a minute. He's saying, look, I want you to know that everything that's happened to me here has been used to help spread the good news of the gospel of Christ. Now, where is here that he's writing from? Any, do you remember? He's in Rome and chained to a guard for 24 hours in this dark, dirty, smelly, underground prison. And he says, I want you to know, I want you to know, all right, that even people in Nero's household, Nero, one of the worst leaders towards Christians, even people in Nero's household came to Christ. People have come to Christ because I'm going through what I'm going through, because I'm a prisoner in Rome. My friends, that's called perspective. Perspective. To be to, in the middle of this darkest, deepest dungeon, and you say, you know what? I need to see how God can use this, not only for me and my good, but for the good of others. Paul's saying, everything that I've gone through, where I find myself right now, What's most important is there are people that are coming to Christ and going to spend eternity with Christ because I am where I am, because God has allowed me to go through where I am and understand what's truly right and truly good and truly important, and I focused on that. And because of that, the gospel of Christ is winning, and people are coming to a saving knowledge of Christ. Again, that's perspective, you know. 
that's perspective. That's why that, that verse in, in Romans is so popular that we read at the very beginning of this. We know, you know, that God causes all things to work together. He doesn't work individually. He says all things that we go through in experience of life can work together. And that's hard for us to understand. See, uh, let, me, let me test some of you bakers out here. Here's a list of ingredients. Now, I'm putting you on the spot, but when you look at that list of ingredients, can anybody tell me what that's going to make? And not chocolate chip cookies, because I didn't leave it out purposely. What's that? Brownies. Wow. Let's see the next slide. Brownies. Yeah. I haven't had breakfast. And <clears throat> I had to go through this at first service. So think of this. That list you saw before you, those ingredients, you are not going to go home for lunch today, I hope not, and sit there and eat those individually. Just have a bowl of this and a plate of flour and uh, over here and sit there and eat that. You wouldn't like that. You wouldn't enjoy it. We don't do that. You know the simple illustration that this is, but I think it's so powerful. But you mix all those together, put it in the oven, and let them bake. I mean, just close your eyes. Smell them coming out of that oven right now. Can you smell that? Oh, those fresh brownies. Now cut yourself a nice big hunk. Now make it bigger. It's okay. God will turn them into no calories. You know, just see that big hunk of warm, hot brownie. Now take some vanilla ice cream. Put it right on top of that. Let's have a moment here, okay? All of that that you wouldn't have individually, God works all things together for good. It's hard for us when we think, can God use evil? Yeah. My friends, that's what the crucifixion was. The crucifixion was evil. Taking the perfect son of Christ and the sinless man and doing what they did to him, that was evil. But out of it came not just good, but some very great things for us, praise God. So God can use all things. If you don't get anything else, understand this. God can and will use, you know, both your, 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 your mistakes, your hurts, your pains, your joys, you know, your good, your goof-ups, to do great things when we are willing to turn to Him, to surrender to Him, to place it into His hands, to call out to Him, to cry out to Him, whatever that moment may need to be, God can and will use it in ways we could never, ever imagine. It's not something to run from our pain. It's something to embrace and let God use it for good within our life to be there. And then the last thing I want to share is I need to share, you need to share, we need to share how Jesus gave us hope through this pain and through what we learned and everything that we went through in that. How he gave us hope. Because everybody needs hope. I've heard this statement many, many times in my ministry, read it in many, many different books in different ways. You know, you know everybody needs hope to cope. And right now, you know, I mean, w the, people have always needed hope to cope. People have always turned and put their hope in the wrong things. And we, you know, it's no different today. We see people putting their hope and their trust in the wrong things, and they're frustrated, you know, and, and they're frustrated, and we're getting frustrated and, and stuff because, you know, we need to stop, we need to turn back, and we need to remember where our hope and our trust needs to fall in to really give us what we need to do in, in the lives that we have and, and that. And we need to share that, you know. We need to share that hope and dispense that hope with the people around us. Again, Paul in that classic passage, you know, that first part, he outlines the pain he's been through. And then in verse 8, he says this, Brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the trouble that we suffer. You know, that's the pain, about the trouble that we suffer in Asia. We had great burdens that were beyond our own strength. We even gave up hope of living. That's how discouraged Paul. Remember what I was talking about? He's human, just like you and I. Here he is, this great Paul guy. I, I, we even gave up as we're sitting there. You know, we got so discouraged. I was ready, you know, whatever. But he said, truly, in our hearts, the flesh is getting discouraged, but the spirit, in our hearts, we believed we would die, but this happened. Why? So that we would not trust in ourselves but in God, who raises people from the dead. So even if our life does end, even if this bad situation that I'm in, even if this pain that I'm suffering, Paul says, comes to it, this is how big of a God I serve. The guy can bring me right back to life if that's what he wants. God saved us from this great dangers of death, and he will continue to save us. We put our hope 
We put our hope in him and he will save us again. I've talked to many people, been blessed to talk to many people, and those that are dealing with pain, some of the most common complaints or, or frustrations or words is my life's out of coal, control. I just can't seem to change it. I want to change, but, but I can't. I feel so hopeless is basically what they're saying because that can happen to all of us because this life, life can kick the hope right out of you in your life. And maybe you've experienced that and know exactly what I'm talking about. Or maybe you're experiencing that now. And you feel hopeless because you feel hopelessly trapped in a job that you just don't understand why you're there or what's going on or hopelessly trapped in a relationship or hopelessly trapped fi in this financial crisis or, or, or whatever health problem. And I go back to what I said earlier. We all need hope to cope. And one of the best places to get hope, of course, is turning to God and understanding that He is there and will be with us. But secondly, is the people around us to be there. And there are people that we can walk with and people that have been there that we can turn to, that we can lean on. So like I said, if you feel like you've had the hope kicked out of you, one of the most beautiful psalms that I, I love to read when that happens to me in my life is the 91st Psalm that says this. When you call to me, this is God speaking, when you call to me, I will answer you. I will be with you when you're in trouble and I will save you and I will honor you. I love that. I love that. Now, that's not saying if you're having deep financial problems that if you come and lean on me, I'm going to write you a check. <laughs> I mean, if I come and lean on you, I know you'll write me a check. That's different, you know. But that's not what that's saying. That's not saying that, you know, whatever in that aspect that God, uh, you know, is going to all of a sudden let you win the lottery. I don't know how he's going to work. But I know when we turn to God, God's promises, and he's never lost a promise, broken a promise. His promise is he will be there. And when we trust him and obey and follow him, it works out in ways a lot of the time, not a lot of times, all, most of the time that we could never, ever imagine that he will be with us. And that's why we need him, but that's also why we need a church family. I don't know how many times you've heard me say it. And again, like I said before, I'm not beating a dead horse, but I, if I have to beat a dead horse to help you understand, I will. We were never created to go through life alone. We need to be there for each other but we have to humble ourselves, you know. We have to humble ourselves and, and that so we can be those because you don't know how to be there for me if I'm not open and honest. A lot of people, they'll run from God, they run from the church. I can't help them. When they run away, I can't help, but when they run to God, when they run to the church, when they run to the church family, then I can help. We're not a perfect church family. We're an imperfect as we read there within Scripture, okay, but we still need to be there. We still need to be a church family together and learn to walk together, fall together, cry together, laugh together, whatever that together looks like that God brings us through. We need that church family to be there because God will be in, and he will help us in that. We just have to be humble enough to accept that, to accept other people, to realize, you know. I, it's one of the hardest things, I think, being a minister, being a pastor. At least I'll speak for myself. You know, it, it, I, I, I look for times and ways that I can be transparent, and I want to be. I want to be the guy that who you see is what you get. The David Anthony Beals that stands on the stage is the same guy that you're going to see. You know, the guys will meet tomorrow night at Men's Night Out. Shameless plug, 6 o'clock, Sam's 2. Uh, for all the guys, you know, it's the same guy you're going to see down at Sam's 2 is the same guy that's standing before you right now. And, and for the most part, I, I think it is. But we all struggle, like I said, because we don't want to let them know the fears that are there. And we're scared of what people are going to think and what are people going to say. But, we, you know, we just have to be transparent. Just because I'm up on stage, don't put me on a pedestal. I will let you down. I, you know, I will, I will stumble as a husband. I have stumbled as a husband. I've stumbled as a father. I've stumbled as a pastor. I've stumbled as a friend. I've stumbled as a coworker. But here's the cool thing you'll let me down too <laughs> because we're imperfect. We're imperfect. Welcome to the church. You know, but it's God's bride and God loves his church and God wants to be there. When we get open, when we get real, when we run to him and we're there with each other, God will and his promises is he will be with us and he will use us in ways we could never ever imagine. Through our pain, he uses it all. He uses every bit of it for his will, for his good, and for his glory. And that's what I hope we understand through this series as we come to this, that this is what he wants to do. You know, that's what we've been talking about. God is bigger, church, than our pain. He's bigger than our problems, and that gives us hope. And the people around us, they don't need to hear about our successes. They need to hear about 
They need to hear about how God has helped us in times of struggle and in painful situations. Are we willing to share how God has used our pain to get our attention? Are we willing to be open about our feelings and our thoughts and our failures and our frustrations and our fears? Because when we get authentic, when we get authentic, you'll be amazed how God will use you to bring hope, not just to your life, but in lives to others around you. And as we get ready to come before these elements here this morning to give thanks and praise for the love that God has for us by sending His Son, I want us to spend some time here and just as you come up and take your two cups and go back to your seat and let God's Holy Spirit, you know, just speak to you and share with you. And is there a pain you've gone through in the past that you're not sure you've been asking why, but maybe today's the day, right now's the day you need to ask what? What was I supposed to learn through that pain? What do you want me to do with that pain I've gone through? Or maybe right now the pain that you're in. What, God? What am I supposed to do with this? How can I, how can I, because God promises that when we turn to him, we can be blessed and benefit from it, but how also can others around me? Show me what that can look like as well, God. Let's take some time. And if you need to talk with someone, one prayer, again, as I always say, if you're watching online, please feel free to give us a call and talk with us so we can do that life together and we can be there for each other. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for this time we could celebrate. We can remember, Father, who you are, the gift of your son and, and what that means to us and the love and the sacrifice that is there. But also, Lord, as we come before these elements, may your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. And Lord, we realize we live in a broken world. And because of that brokenness, we can't avoid pain, Heavenly Father. But we can choose what we do with that. And we praise you that we have you that gives us those promises that you're willing to be there and walk with us through that. Sometimes remove if that's your will, but you're willing to be there, Father God, for us. Lord, help us to take a look and and ask what? What is it we can learn? How can we grow closer to you, to trust you more? Take some time and let your Holy Spirit speak that truth into our lives today, Father God, so we can be the church and the people you want us to be. Thanks again so much for this time of celebration. We thank you and praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
this song. Whoops, <laughs> that's my fault. Sorry. There's one more. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you for joining us. Have a good week.